Prime Minister intervenes in land dispute. Chinese businessmen arrested for selling counterfeit cigarettes. And 13 teams to compete in Plum R Filch season. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Wednesday's news. Prime Minister James Marape has intervened in a land dispute between Central Province and NCD. His intervention is purely based on the welfare of the people, both settlers and the Koyara people living on portion 1221. This was made known by member for Mosby Northeast, John Carper, when he received a petition from the Koyari landowners on behalf of the Prime Minister. The landowners have given the government 21 days to respond. The dull weather in Port Moresby today did not stop these aggrieved landowners and settlers from marching from 14 mile to 9 mile junction at the foot of Mount Eriyama demanding to see the Prime Minister. The protest march rose from an eviction exercise ordered by NCD that started yesterday on portion 1221 at 14 mile. According to the landowners, about 7,000 people, both settlers and landowners, live on that portion of land. The landowners today threatened to shut Eda Rano's water treatment plant at Mount Eriyama that supplies water into Port Moresby City. The action prompted police units into the area to ensure the gathering was peaceful. At around 12 noon, member for Mosby Notice John Cowper arrived with representatives from the Prime Minister's office. He explained that he was there to receive their petition on behalf of the Prime Minister, also assuring them that the Prime Minister wants the eviction at 14 Mile to be put on hold. <laughs> Human rights now are mounting down on this ground. Obviously, Prime Minister come talks away. Also, my eviction must not get come up until you may find him not a half. This news was clearly welcomed by the settlers and the Behori landowners. Chairman of the Behori clan, Foxy Kayaka, presented their petition to Kaupa, giving the government 21 days to respond. Same respect you have to give it to us. Part of the 11 points demand is that no further actions be taken on eviction proceedings against members of the Behori clan or those permitted by members of the Behori clan living on the customary land along the corridors of the old Riga Road and adjoining portion 1221 Granville. One of them didn't blow you, suppose you rouse him, me blood respect him. Suppose one of them wrote you come logging. But go rouse him, Warana, how I blow you, no come put him log it on blow you. Me blood no need him money blow you, rouse him, Warana Pine, rouse him, Delta 66, put him the road corridor, he was servicing all human beings for most people. The land in dispute is also causing friction at the top level of provincial governments. Governor for Central alleging that portion 1221 is central provincial government's land and was illegally given to NCD. Shamin Poreambev, National MTV News. Dr. Matthew Landu from the Enga campus of Divine Word University said the institution will realize PNG's dream of strengthening English and science learning. Dr. Landu was speaking during the two-day visit by delegates from the New Zealand High Commission to Inga province recently. Vasanatayama has more. The University of Goroka Enga campus was established at the beginning of this year with an understanding by the University Council and Enga Provincial Government that quality education in teacher training in English and science courses are priority. UOG Enga campus is currently offering bachelor degree programs in English, math, chemistry, biology and physics. After four years of content training, students will complete one year of diploma in education to enable them to teach in secondary schools. So our students also will be able to, to, to compete uh, nationwide and also uh, in the rest of the world. That's uh, the dream. 
first uh, with the University of Gork and eventually uh, to realize the governor's bigger dream of uh, having his, uh, his own university here. However, for long term, the Enga Provincial Government and the University Council are planning to have students graduate in their degree program and continue to academia or scientific research. We don't have, the, uh, we don't have the, those programs here yet. Now we want our students to really be the best. So our, our staff also will have um, uh, possibilities of training. In those fields. The students will have the opportunity to achieve an honours degree, master's degree or philosophy degree, but done overseas before they reach the age of 30. This is to address science problems in the country and in future teachers can teach science, technology, engineering and math or STEM subjects in secondary schools. And uh, he's brought the University of Goroka here to help him address this problem. And we certainly will do our very best. We follow the programs of the University of Goroka uh, to maintain standards and quality and really try to see ways forward. Because this is a, a nationwide problem that's uh, been around for some time. And somebody has to take the initiative to address the problem. Dr. Matthew Landu also requested for experts in English and science fields overseas to work with them to pass on their expert knowledge. New Zealand High Commissioner Philip Towler, who visited the campus yesterday, was pleased to see such a focus on education. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the need for healthy living and living a healthy and balanced lifestyle is being encouraged by SME fitness groups in Papua New Guinea. Chukai Industries is one company promoting healthy lifestyles by supporting SME fitness groups recover from the effects of COVID-19. Businesses of all forms have been affected in Papua New Guinea during the COVID-19 crisis. And with the health of people being at risk and measures put in place by authorities in PNG's response to COVID-19, having balanced and nutritious meals has been one important part of it. But keeping fit is another vital aspect of it. During lockdown periods, sports athletes and those doing fitness and exercise had to shift to other ways of doing it, including online methods. And as a result, SMEs in the fitness industry have been impacted. When the news broke that all oh, COVID hit Papua New Guinea, we didn't know how to really go about like trying to keep our gym open or running or our business running for a, for a while, especially operations. So what Cecil said, like they're paying rent, we're also paying rent. Everything shut down for peak fitness at the time. So uh, like... Both my colleagues said we had to find a way to um, adjust, um, reset and look for ways to keep, keep the brand moving forward. Trukai Industries Limited is not only a major rice supplier in the country, but also a promoter of healthy living lifestyles. Today, the company presented five SME fitness groups with a total of 50,000 kina sponsorship. Each fitness company received 10,000 kina to assist their programs and provide some form of relief for their businesses. Most of the customer base that we have for our consumers and for these SMEs as well, they always strive for the accessibility to the services. Most of it is out of our reach due to cost, due to access locations, and most of the gyms that are available are through private memberships. And these SMEs have taken the endeavor to create that accessibility, to create that platform for everyone, to strive to live a balanced and healthy lifestyle. Primal Capital Fitness is one of those SMEs in the country that will benefit from Trukai's sponsorship package. As Papua New Guineans adapt to the new normal, business begins to recover from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic this year. Denis Orere, National MTV News. 
Following the relaxing of COVID-19 restrictions, national flight carrier in New Guinea has resumed international flights to Hong Kong commencing today. The first Air New Guinea flight into Hong Kong after the lockdown departed Port Moresby today at 3 p.m. and is scheduled to arrive in Hong Kong at 7.30 p.m. local time. This weekly service will be operated through a code-sharing agreement between Air New Guinea and Cathay Pacific. Meanwhile, flights from Port Moresby into Singapore remain suspended. You're watching National MTV News. We'll have more of the day's stories after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. A 30-year-old man from Fujian province in China is awaiting formal charges from lay police after being arrested last week for selling counterfeit cigarettes. Police confiscated over 200 packets of counterfeit cigarettes from his shop. Investigations are currently underway. Julie Badui Oa with this report. According to Lei Metropolitan Commander Chief Superintendent Chris Kunyanban, the cigarettes are subject to investigation and will be taken in for testing. Kunyanban said the matter would be seriously looked into once the test result is obtained from the British American Tobacco in Medellin. Those uh, cigarettes, are they been harmful to human consumption and all this? That will be taken further. Uh, for investigation and for analysis in Merang. Our team will be traveling to Merang uh, next week to do that. And once the report is finalized, then uh, we will go further. Last week, lay police confiscated 272 packets of counterfeit cigarettes from a Chinese shop trading as Selling Star Enterprise Limited, operating here in Lei. According to Chief Superintendent Kunyanban, the shop owner, a 30-year-old man from the Fujian province in China, claimed that he bought the cigarettes from the street vendors. He was arrested by the police and is currently awaiting formal charges to be laid against him. If all the agencies of the government are working together and the government is supporting the agencies, we will be suppressing this type of issues. Uh, like now, for instance, the cigarettes now we have here, if the, if the government is not helping us, police, to address this issue, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult because we will still have uh, the incident uh, reoccurring in different parts of the country and it will be having a very detrimental effect on the business in, in terms of economic growth. Uh, you can understand as you can see here, the cigarettes, are, the counterfeits have been selling for 20 kina. It's almost uh, 5 or 7 kina less than the genuine cigarettes been sold to people. And you can see how much it's done to the economy already. And the other thing, on the other hand, also we must be mindful is the type of the content they use to make cigarettes. Are they being uh, allowed by the government of Papua New Guinea to be consumed by the, uh, the citizens? Or are they being just made for the sake of making money? Selling Star Enterprise Limited is one of the many foreign-owned businesses operating in Lay, reported to be selling counterfeit products. These illegal practices by the foreign investors continues to grow here in Lay and throughout the country. Kunyanban called on the government to seriously review the laws and regulations of this country to combat such practices. Julie Badui, Owa, National MTV News, Lay. The Butibam Road remains closed as locals call on the Morabe provincial government to upgrade a drainage system in their community. The continuous overflowing of the storm drain along the Butibam Road has worsened. It is affecting families nearest to the road. There are also concerns of health risks. Leaders of the Butibam community presented a letter of demand to the MPG today to address the issue immediately. Meanwhile, locals say the Butibam Road will remain closed until they get a response. Koge Village outside Mount Hagen City celebrated its 20th anniversary as a reformed village recently. It was once unsafe to live in this village back in the 90s. The village situated on the outskirts of Mount Hagen City was a breeding ground for a group known as Jika Panga Rebels and Operation Puli Mary. This is the story of the reformed gang that's now instilling Christian values in the community. The Jigapanga tribe of the Hagen Open electorate comes from this big village of Kogenamba with a population of over 3,000 people. They share borders with the Mul people of the Mul Baya electorate. 
In the past, this area was a no-go zone for visiting women from nearby tribes. Young, married or old women were raped when visiting or passing through the village by a gang calling themselves Operation Pulley Mary. At the height of this reign, the Panga rebels terrorized towns they visited by walking in and out of stores with cash or store goods without paying for them. Rebels no. also go all the town, also pulling billion blow man, also going to the store, simple sandy or like blow, nah. also walking kind again, plant heavy also coming to the community. At the turn of the new millennium, few local leaders made a covenant by giving the community back to the Lord. This was in the year 2000. Every October 20th, Local churches in the Koge village come together for fellowship. This year they celebrated their 20th anniversary. As a result of this, they have seen children completing their studies and are working and getting involved in farming activities. Now this is the people this is the man, all converted, all come up all pastors, all engaged along all farming activities, agricultural activities, plenty people all businessmen, plenty people all now all come up and all working all big, all permanent, all buildings all. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. Locals in Turubu LLG in Wewak District are expected to benefit from a community health post which was officially opened by Australian High Commissioner to PNG John Philp. Located in the Taul area, the East Sepik Provincial Government has acknowledged the support of the Australian Government and other partners to build this vital service. East Sepik Governor Alan Bird said together with the Asian Development Bank and Go PNG, the locals in Turubu are very fortunate to have this facility so them. Meanwhile, the partners are also doing some maintenance work at the district hospital in Ambunti. And now looking at the NAS fund market report, the Kina opened unchanged at 0 0.2860 US dollars in the interbank markets. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina is buying 0.2785 US dollars, 0.3874 Australian dollars, 0.4125 New Zealand dollars and 28.44 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading lower, coffee and copra closed higher and cocoa closed lower. Crude oil is trading lower, palm oil and copper closed lower. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed lower, the ASX 200 is trading lower and the All Ordinaries is trading higher. Among stories after the break, early childhood learning program launched in Morbe. Details after the break. Welcome back to the news. The early childhood learning program that is likely to be implemented in the country in 2022 was officially launched in Kabum district in Morbe province. The launching follows the signing of an MOU in lay three weeks ago on teachers training. Morbe's elementary division initiated the program in 2013 that was trialled at a remote village in Kabum district. Julie Badiwi Owa reports. This is Bomu Early Childhood School located in Selepet, LLG of Kabum District, Morobe. It is the birthplace of the Early Childhood Learning Program that began seven years ago. This last school is a triple teacher. Now, long 2016, and Narapla came in. We play at Inonap. So, Narapla came in, a teacher man. Okay, this la teacher man and teach him K2. This la um, two years long him la teach. Na me yet um, one Narab la teacher Mary and um, Tatlas. The school has graduated over 30 students since 2013 to Titsit Elementary School, the feeder school of Titsit Primary School in Bomu. The students from the kindergarten or early childhood from here down to our primary school there. At uh, from my observation, generally they are they are doing fine. They are really fine. The smaller ones, the age of seven, the age of seven. But when we take them in, in enroll them in uh, at grade three, they begin to show us that they can they can be able to. 
uh, read or write. So it's a good start indeed. Morbe's elementary education division, headed by then provincial elementary coordinator Harin Koreka, initiated the early childhood program in 2013. The concept of the program was presented to Morbe's provincial executive council and was approved to roll out in all elementary schools. elementary schools now Papua New Guinea by staff, that's all name and senis. All the teachers by you plus staff, that's all training by change in mindset by For the training of teachers, it will take place in Ellsberg beginning 2020. However, this training will be strictly monitored based on qualification. Meaning that uh, for the mixed mode, we will allow the teachers to be enrolled, but it will still be based on qualification. Meaning that grade 6, if someone is a grade 6, 7 or 8 or 9 and has been doing this uh, mixed mode, by now the teacher must have a grade 10 certificate to qualify for the mixed mode training. After the mixed board, any teacher who wish to, uh, to enroll and continue on on early childhood uh, will now have a grade 12 qualification, which is now a prerequisite requirement for every teacher who wants to go to teacher college. The early childhood learning is a three years program focused on toddlers at the age of two to seven years. The Morabe Provincial Government then came up with the 366 structure with three years of early childhood learning, six years for primary education, and six years of secondary. The ELC PNG Education Secretary and member of the National Education Board, Elisha Waga, presented the Morbes education structure to the national government. The structure was approved and adapted by the Education Department. It is most likely to roll out in the country in 2022. Therefore, uh, with the Christian education, the teachers are also told to teach the uh, religious education uh, at the base level, which is the elementary or rather now elementary have changed to the uh, early childhood. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News. And turning overseas to the U.S. election 2020, now the donkey and the elephant are racing for the U.S. presidential seat. That's the symbol of the Democratic and Republican parties as the battle for the White House hits up with Donald Trump taking the election's final sprint to new levels. Rain, snow and sub-zero temperatures were no match for the thousands of Trump fans. Everybody now! queuing for hours in the cold just to catch a glimpse of their president. <laughs> Visiting their town, Lansing, Michigan. It'll be the first time in my lifetime that I get to see an actual sitting president. But this is no coincidence. Just seven days to go and Donald Trump's lagging his rival in all the battleground states. I feel so guilty you're waiting out here in the rain. He's fighting the Democrats at every government level. It worries me that there is um, anyone with a platform that is coddling or encouraging uh, efforts to terrorize their fellow Americans. This is domestic terrorism. In an open war with Michigan's governor, Democrat Gretchen Whitmer. I don't think she likes me too much. After the governor ordered a statewide stay-at-home order to stop the spread of coronavirus, which she then tried to extend. And that's when the trouble really started here at the state capitol. White militia stormed the building, protesting the lockdown and threatening violence against the governor. You'll be traitors! But worse was yet to come. <laughs> This rally just days after the FBI foiled a plot to kidnap and possibly kill Governor Whitmer, allegedly by the same militia. The enemy is not our fellow Americans. The enemy is a virus that is a threat to every one of us. Tell that to Trump supporters. Downs are to, the lockdowns are all done by the Democrats, uh, you know, states and stuff, just to keep the economy down so Trump doesn't do well. Michigan's currently going through a second wave of coronavirus. Daily case numbers not seen since June. I had the virus and I'm fine. And after waiting in line for hours... Too cold? i seen what I came for. <laughs> within minutes of his arrival, it was time to leave. Did you get to see the president? Yeah. Yes. Got pictures of him. They're just here to see their man, 
They already know his message. To Melbourne tonight, the city known for its bar, food and culture is celebrating after four months of lockdown. Victorians enjoy their first day of relaxed restrictions today. You would have thought it was New Year's Eve. But these were the scenes in Melbourne last night. After four long months, the city loosening its COVID-19 restrictions. The hospitality and retail sector leaping back to life. Businesses still have to comply with strict gathering rules, with masks likely mandatory right through until 2021. But Kiwis in Melbourne making the most of the new freedom. And dinner tonight, so we're having friends over inside our house for the first time in, I don't know, six, yeah, well, probably four months. I think June was the last time. So uh, it's just wild, isn't it? But Others keen to head out. My wife was even just saying this morning she was watching the news and uh, people were... Uh, lining up for Kmart and there was like this sense of normality and even she said she got a little emotional over that. Victoria is still recording new coronavirus cases, two today. Officials are urging people not to get complacent. We've all got to be COVID safe, we've all got to follow the rules to protect staff, to protect customers uh, but also to protect this fragile thing that we've all built. The state's long lockdown has triggered a worsening economic fallout. At a minimum, it's predicted to cost Melbourne over $50 billion and 31,000 jobs. Uh, you know, I've even just heard from, from friends uh, that they've got friends who have just been told, you know, at the end of the year their jobs are wrapping up because the, the, the companies they work for just can't continue to afford to employ them. The reopening, a huge step forward for the state. I don't know that I'll be drinking a beer tonight. I might go a little higher up the shelf. And judging by last night, he wasn't alone. And Trukai Sports is next. Here's Fidli Sukina. Thank you, Helen. Poor Barafel season sees only 13 teams competing due to COVID-19. And Justin Olam speaks of his grand final debut and some news on cricket as well. Those stories in Trukai Sports when we come back. Tukai Sports. Good night and welcome to Tukai Sports. The 71st season of the Port Mosby Rugby Football League is expected to end in November. With COVID-19 delaying the start of the season, only 13 teams are taking part this year with one club opting out of the competition. With a delay in their competition, the Port Mosby Rugby Football League have now moved their finals to the end of November. So I am looking at end of November for our finals and hopefully a presentation. Uh, we have everything done. I think we have uh, enough money left to put uh, some prize money for the clubs. Mike Mino, the administrator of Poma RFL, says that due to the shortened season and their financial situation, the prize money for the winners will not be the same as the previous seasons. Because it's not a normal season and it's, it's a very short season, we can't go by our president of 20,000 for the winners and 10,000 for the winners in the minor grades and all that. Uh, but definitely uh, we have prize money available to end the competition well. But there is some positive news for the fans and followers of the league. With restrictions for crowd numbers lifted, this weekend we'll see the crowds return to the competition. As well as the Pormos Rugby League Board has now agreed to allow supporters and spectators to enter the gates and watch the games. So which is a plus for all of us, not just us, but all our supporters, our players and their families. But the competition will still abide by the COVID-19 protocols put in place during the start of the season this year. Uh, PP is still with us. We will be maintaining the maintaining the social distancing. We will be maintaining the temperature checks, which is very very strict at the gate. On Sunday, PNG saw Justin Olam play his first ever NRL Grand Final. In this NRL post Grand Final interview of the PNG International Sensation, Olam says it is a dream come true to win his first ever NRL Premiership. I still can't believe it. Um, when I started 
I was just happy to play one game and to make it to the grand final and actually win it. Um, it's it's such a blessing. All the glory and honor back to the man upstairs. And yeah, I'm, I'm so blessed. Can't say much. It is special for me uh, personally and for my family and friends as well. I wanted really wanted to win one, and because uh, Marcus by he is the first um, homegrown talent to come here and win one. So I wanted to be, you know, be like him. So to you know, Matsy's achievement is it's pretty special to me as well, and to do it with the same club, Melbourne Storm. I always go and watch um, big games, State of Origin, things like that. But it was just a fairy tale, and it was a dream that will never gonna, was never going to happen. But to actually come here, and then when I got the chance, like I said, um, I was just happy to play one game and to actually win a Premiership. That's that's so much blessing. And to cricket, former PNG Baramandi strike batsman Kilapala says Baramandis need to work on their batting in preparation for the 2021 T20 World Cup. Pala, also a former coach of the PNG under-19 side, the Garamuts, says it is always an honor to wear the red, black and gold colors. Pala, who is now running the local cricket competition in Hula Village, spoke to MTV recently. For, for me personally, I was just wearing the black and gold uh, for PNG. I mean, it's, it's an honor in itself um, representing the country. It has been a, a, a big step for the boys um, going into the, into the uh, World Cup. Um, we trust and believe that they, they will do better. I think the, the area that we really need to really, really you know, improve and really you know, put a mark on is in our betting. I think we, we've, got, we've got bowlers there who can who can take early wickets. We just need the batters to do their job so the bowlers can bowl to a, to a certain or a low target. Uh, with the field inside of things, it's just, you know, we, we, uh, we're right up there with the best in, in, in terms of fielding. But I think our betting needs, needs to be looked at. I mean, it's been looked at by Joe Doss and all that stuff. And they're working really, really closely with the, with, with the players. Hopefully, you know, they can all chip in when, when, when the time is right for them to, to take PNG over the line. And still ahead, volleyball action in NCD and some news on the Tokyo Olympics. Stay with us. Trukai Sports. And welcome back to Trukai Sports. GIG from Gereka are the 2020 Queens of the inaugural Datako Manubada Volleyball Association Women's Division. They beat Kapua from Kirakira Village three sets to two. Meanwhile, in the under 21s, Kapua beat Gereka. Only two clubs were dominant in the competition that was aimed to bring out the best from the Motu Koita villages. GIG from Gereka and Kapua from Kirakira both filed teams in each respective divisions. In the women's division, minor premiers Gereka were up for glory against the women from Kirakira, the better side led from the start. Gereka taking the match at three sets to one. In the under-21s, though, Kirakira wanted one back. Besides the minor premiership tag, the team showed it had one of the best under-21 development pathways in the nation and it proved on grand final day. They took the game in a three sets to nil convincing win. Four weeks of uh, using the stadium here and we, we really thank God for it. Uh, at the same time also during the finals week we also had our, uh, our, our new uh, uniforms which is sponsored by Sangu Solutions. Uh, we really thank God, brought a class to the association brought, you know, a, a very good image to our association and then having to play in a stadium like this, just an added bonus. The association president was happy with the turnout of events and is looking forward to the future. To us, uh, yeah, already clubs have shown interest to come in, uh, but that uh, will be, uh, will have an executive uh, uh, addition on that and then push it forward to the board. Uh, we see which one is viable. Bradley Valenaki, Trukai Sports. 
and one of the fastest men in history will miss the Tokyo Olympic Games. American Christian Coleman has been banned for two years for repeatedly missing a drug test. This story is steeped in irony. The fastest man on the planet at the moment was apparently late home from Christmas shopping last December and missed the drug testing offices at his house in Kentucky. At the end of the day, I just want to be able to run. Like, this is my job, this is my career. Up until now, he's been good at his job. 24-year-old Coleman won the World 100 Metres title in September last year. But that was under a cloud. He previously missed a drug test in January 2019 and also didn't confirm his whereabouts on two other other occasions last year. Three strikes and you're out. Look, it's appalling. Um, we fight every day for our clean athletes and you expect your elite athletes to support what we're doing. It just reeks, it makes you suspicious of it, you know, is he trying to cover something up? Let's get this straight. Christian Coleman has never tested positive, but his suspension means no Olympics, unless he wins an appeal. Our leading athletes, Olympians, rugby players, netballers, whoever, must also provide a daily whereabouts schedule. And we'll choose the day, and we won't tell them we're coming. It's unannounced, they get a knock on the door, and they said they'll be there, and they're expected to be there. Yeah, it can be invasive to a certain extent, but you want to clean sport, you want your opposition to be clean and you, you need to be available for testing. Since the end of Kiwi lockdown, drug-free sport is testing more than ever. Internationally, however, it's a different story. We know back in April, um, internationally, the number of samples collected dropped by 95%. At the same time as Coleman's ban, new investigations are beginning in France into Algerian runner Taufik Magloufi. He won gold in the 1500 in 2012 in London. Why do we care? Magloufi also won silver at Rio in 2016, ahead of Kiwi Nick Willis. It's, it's not a shock. There's been a lot of rumours around McLoofy, but, um, you know, it's too early to tell yet. COVID or not, Olympic Games or not, the spectre of drugs is never far away. And that story wraps up Trukai Sports. Helen will be back with a weather report for the next 24 hours. Good night. Trukai Sports. True Kai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast tonight and tomorrow in the southern region. Rain showers and thunder easing tonight and fine cloudy morning in Port Moresby. Rain showers and thunderstorm easing tonight and with a cloudy morning in Daru and Kerama. Thundery rain showers tonight and fine, although partly cloudy morning in Alotau. Then a few rain showers and drizzles tonight and tomorrow in Popendita. In the Mombasa region, a few rain drizzles tonight and fine tomorrow in Leh and Medang. A few thundery showers tonight and fine morning in Wewak and mostly fine, although partly cloudy in Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, thundery rain showers tonight and a fine cloudy day tomorrow in Lorengau and Kimbe. A few showers tonight and fine partly cloudy tomorrow in Kaviang, partly cloudy tonight and tomorrow in Kokopo and Rabaul and fine although partly cloudy tomorrow in Buka. And in the Highlands region, a few rain drizzles tonight then morning fog in Mount Hagen and a rain showers with thunder tonight, then morning fog patches in Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. Forecast for small crafts for the next 24 hours, waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait to Daru, to Kiwai Islands, Kerama, to Yul Island, to Hood Point, to Samaria Island, seas of 0.5 to 1.5 metres. Waters of Eastern and Western Milne Bay Islands with waters of Long Island to Karkar Island to Wewak to Aitape to the Northern PAG Indonesian border and with waters of East and West New Britain seas of 0.5 to 1.3 meters. Waters of Samari Island to East Cape to Cape Vogel through Huen Gulf to Finchhafen with waters of Finchhafen through Vityaz and Dampier Straits to Siasi and Long Islands 
with waters of Manus and its western group of islands, including waters of New Ireland and Bougainville, seas of 0.5 to 1 metre. Look at the ocean forecast. The PNG areas in the Coral Sea sees slight with southeast to southwest winds at 10 to 15 knots. In the Solomon Sea, seas smooth to slight with southeast to southwest winds at 5 to 15 knots. In the Bismarck Sea, seas smooth to slight with southeast to northwest winds at 5 to 15 knots. And in the Pacific Ocean, Seas smooth to slight with northeast to southeasterly winds at 5 to 15 knots. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. And that ends MTV News this Wednesday, the 28th of October 2020. On behalf of the entire news team, pleasant viewing. Good night. <laughs>